of uh, the WorkNet DuPage Virtual Job Club. This is our new world for right now. And I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, we have Megan Straza today uh, from Heinz VA, and she will talk about how to find a federal job with USA Jobs. And I'm hearing that it's a little bit easier, and she will help us navigate that system. So uh, some of the staff that are going to be on here today, uh, of course myself, I'm the manager of Job Seeker and Veteran Services at WorkNet DuPage. Amy Ulo is our manager of marketing and communication. Good morning. Uh, Javon Morris is workshop facilitator. Good morning. And Jennifer Wegeman is a workshop facilitator as well. Good morning. So, yeah, so you're gonna see us uh, in the chat rooms. Uh, I think what we're gonna do is if you have questions, put them in Q&A and I will uh, bring them up to Megan. Uh, if they're relevant to the topic she's on at that moment, we'll talk about it. Uh, and maybe I'll just bring it up and ask her if she's gonna cover it a little later. Uh, we have the chat room open. Please keep it focused on the workshop today. Uh, and we'd appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about what we do at WorkNet DuPage. We are funded uh, through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, or the WIOA grant, as it's commonly referred to. Uh, we have the Virtual Job Club every Friday, uh, which is open to the public. Uh, at the conclusion today, I'll talk about upcoming uh, job clubs for the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you if you do uh, come through our program, we have an application uh, on worknetdupage.org. Uh, we do have a job search boot camp uh, for registered clients, those who've come in uh, to our program. And then we also offer additional job search workshops. We do have training grants up to $10,000. Uh, since we are grant funded, you do have to qualify for our program. Uh, and to help you do that is we have a layoff to launch workshop every Tuesday. So let me go there. Uh, we do have grant uh, funding and we do have this workshop Tuesdays at 9.30 a.m. Uh, you can register on that through our website at worknetdupage.org slash launch. Uh, we also will talk about how you can continue to receive your unemployment benefits while you are in some sort of training and there's no need to pay back the funds because this is your tax dollars at work. Um, so that's where we're at. If you have questions, uh, please visit worknetdupage.org. Uh, the application for launch is on there as well as future workshops, job clubs, uh, and, and we also are posting all of the job club videos on our website as well, previous job clubs. Okay, uh, Megan, I am going to swap it over to you, and while we're doing that, I wanna introduce you, okay? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, Megan and I met a few years ago. I, I, back before all this craziness, I used to run a quarterly veterans uh, employment and services workshop. And uh, I've presented at the VA uh, for Megan. And uh, she is a certified rehabilitation counselor and licensed clinical professional counselor. Uh, she has been working uh, at the VA, Heinz, Heinz VA, as a vocational rehab counselor in the Compensated Work Therapy uh, Supported Employment Program. Uh, she's been there for eight years. Uh, through this program, uh, Megan serves veterans uh, who have serious mental illness and overcoming those barriers and finding and maintaining employment. Uh, she also co-manages the EEO Individuals with Disabilities Committee where she provides information to the local VA community about the benefits of hiring people with disabilities 
and special hiring authorities with the federal government. Uh, prior to this, she had a similar role with the Workman's Compensation Company. Additionally, she works part-time uh, providing individual therapy uh, in a private practice setting. So at this time, uh, Megan, I am going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Can, can we all hear me okay? Are we good, Jim? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about applying for federal jobs using um, the usajobs.gov website. Um, I work at the VA, like Jim says, um, working with veterans of all different backgrounds, uh, educational experiences, work experiences, and um, you know, some of what we're doing is helping veterans find jobs um, in the community, in the private sector, but oftentimes um, people want to work in the federal government. Um, some want to work at Heinz in particular um, for things like benefits and you know higher wages and all that. So we do do a lot of applications um, weekly <laughs> um, with the veterans here and we understand that it, it can be really tricky to kind of navigate and it certainly doesn't help that they're changing things up on the website all the time. So we're going to kind of talk about <clears throat> excuse me um, the different hiring paths, um, what to look for, um, here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about um, kind of setting up your account from the very beginning, how to look for different jobs, um, understanding the hiring paths. Um, a lot of times we have people that come to us and they say, I was eligible for this job and I applied for it. I have the education, I have the experience, but I was still denied or they told me I was ineligible. A lot of times it's kind of navigating those hiring paths um, and learning what those symbols mean. Um, some jobs are for veterans only or some jobs are posted for internal candidates or um, there's different special hiring authorities that we're going to talk about. Um, so it's kind of navigating that and seeing if you're eligible for the position even beyond the qualifications. Um, we're going to talk about veteran preferences and special hiring authorities. Um, and we're going to talk about reading the job announcement, kind of completing the application, what a federal resume looks like, and then what the interview process is here. Um, <clears throat> so USAjobs.gov is a free web-based um, job search um, website. Um, you can build and upload up to uh, five resumes and 10 different documents. Um, once you kind of do this the first time, it gets a lot easier because then it's just your documents are uploaded and you're kind of just selecting and clicking through um, to add those to your application. So it does get easier after the first time. Um, there is a mobile app. Um, you can set up job alerts. You can get updates um, and check the status of the job application once you've submitted it. Um, so that's kind of nice. Sorry, I'm toggling between a couple screens here. So that's why if you notice, I'm looking back and forth. <laughs> um, so the very first thing you're gonna do is set up your, um, your USA Jobs account. So you have to have an email address um, to kind of, and you know, you're gonna do your username, password, set up your profile. The website has changed recently. So you'll need to do, they're doing this account verification so you can, set that up using a mobile number or using, I think, an email address or um, they give you a couple different ways you can sort of verify your account. What that means though is that every time that you log into USA Jobs going forward, you'll put in your username, you'll put in your password, and then they're gonna send you that verification code. So I, for example, have mine set up through text. They'll text me a code. I have to put that code in in order to complete the login. And it's a unique code for each time you log in. Um, they're just trying to keep it fresh, I guess. <laughs> um, so once you set up your login and your email, you're going to go through your profile and put in your information, contact information, eligibility um, information, demographics, work preferences. Employers aren't going to see this. Um, so it doesn't have to be super buttoned up, um, but it is helpful for you to complete that because um, later on as you get to the like application manager, um, they'll kind of autofill some information for you. So it kind of helps um, 
uh, with that. Um, so this is kind of what the sign-in page is. If you haven't already been, um, or the you know the search page, um, if you haven't already been on USA Jobs before, um, you can search by job title, department, agency you want to work for, city, state, all of that. Megan, is there an app for this, or is it just the US? There is an app. I've heard some mixed feedback on whether or not the app is useful or um, or so. I mean. If there is an app, I don't, I personally haven't used it myself. I only kind of have some secondhand feedback on it, but there, there is an app. Um, maybe they've worked out some bugs since it first rolled out, but. So it's better to go directly to the website then? I do think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank um, so this would be, so when you're searching for vacancies, you know, like I said, you can look for keywords um, like administrative or, um, you know, if you don't have a specific job title in mind. Um, you can filter by the hiring path. You'll see there's some arrows I have pointed here um, on these screenshots. I just searched what my job title is um, and you'll see lots of different things, pieces of information on here. Um, you can search by salary. So if you're not familiar with the GS pay scale, which is what we use here, um, it, but you know roughly like you are looking to earn 50 or $60,000 a year, you know, you can just do the salary feature and they'll give you jobs that are in the GS pay scale of, of what that would be. Um, the little symbols that you see, um, there's an arrow pointing to the little symbols there. Um, those are going to tie to the hiring paths, which we will get into more information or into more detail with. Um, they list the open and closing dates, um, which is important to pay attention to. Um, some jobs are only open for a very short time, maybe a few days. Some are open for two weeks, so it kind of depends. Um, on the screenshot I have on the far, uh, the bottom right hand corner, <clears throat> there's the list of the um, hiring paths and the symbols associated with them. So um, if you feel unsure when you're looking at a job, they have that on the right side for you. Um, so what do these hiring paths mean? Um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, and pro most likely, probably only a few of them may apply to you. Um, there's open to the public, uh, federal employees, so internal applicants. They can specify and say internal to the agency only. So let's say you are a federal employee, but you work at the Department of Justice and you want to work for Department of Veterans Affairs. There might be a job that may only be open to Department of VA staff. So even though you're in a federal system, you still wouldn't be able to apply for it. Um, family of overseas employees, um, there's veteran um, uh, hiring paths, and we'll talk a little bit more about the five versus the 10 point preferences. Um, there are jobs that are posted specifically for individuals with disabilities. That's called um, the Schedule A Hiring Authority. And I, again, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, and if ever you're applying for a job and you feel unsure about whether or not you would qualify given a certain hiring path, if you click on the picture of the hiring path, um, it'll take you to an explanation of who, who is eligible um, under that. So, um, and then these are just some more paths, military spouses, National Guard, Peace Corps, Native Americans. Um, and if you wanna set up job alerts, you can set them up with, um, those preferences. So maybe you're a veteran and an individual with a disability um, and you're uh, not in the federal government, so open to the public, you can kind of select your preferences so that if you get job lead alerts, it'll be job leads that fall under those three hiring paths. Okay, so I apologize if there are, are non-veterans on the call. Um, we're gonna get into a little bit just into what the veteran preferences are um, and some of those special hiring authorities because there are some jobs. There, there is a, a unique hiring path that is listed on the far right and it just says special hiring authorities. Um, and so what that really includes is um, people people who fall under veteran special hiring authorities. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a little bit about that. Um, obviously there's five points or 10 point preferences and that kind of depends on when you served, 
um, whether you have a service connected disability, how long you served, um, or if you're the spouse, widow um, of someone who was a, had a service connected disability, things like that. Um, not every person who served in the military is eligible for five point preferences. So if you see on the chart on the left, it has all of the different dates of um, who would be eligible for five points. Um, obviously, to even be eligible for both, you do have to have an honorable or a general um, discharge. Um, the 10 point preference is specifically for people who have a service connected disability. Um, even if you're 0% service connected and you're not receiving any compensation from the VA, um, that would still qualify you for the 10 point preference. Um, are there any questions here coming up from before I move on to the next slide? Uh, yes, I got a couple here. Sure. Uh, someone has a, a problem, they have a USA uh, jobs account, but they no longer have access to that email. Mm. Uh, should this person uh, create a new account? Uh, like a new email account to log in or, or, or a new USA, USA. job? Well, so if you try to create a USA, a new USA jobs account with that email, they're going to say there's already an account created with this email. So you could try to troubleshoot that and but, or is it easier to just create a new email address that maybe you just say, okay, I'm gonna use this one for job searching. Um, I personally think that's probably the path of least resistance. Um, but yeah, that, that does happen is that if there's already an email account designated under USA Jobs, you probably can't create another account with that email. Okay. And then is there hands-on help you can offer uh with applying for a job that this person's interested in? Mm -hmm. um, hands on help for individuals looking to apply for jobs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can, I'll provide my contact information at the end of the presentation. Okay, and what about prior uh, federal employees? Yes, so there is, um, where that will matter um, is not necessarily in the hiring paths, um, where that will come up is, you know, there's such a thing, and, and we will talk about it later in the presentation, called time and grade. So that only applies to people who are current federal employees or have prior federal uh, employee experience. And what that basically means is if I'm applying for a position and it's listed as a, the salary range is listed as a GS-12, I need to have one full year of time and grade at the next lower level. So one full year of experience as a GS-11 in order to apply for a 12. Okay. So if, my job, my, if my job in prior service was a GS-7, I wouldn't, really, I wouldn't be eligible for the GS-12 because I wouldn't have what's called time and grade. Okay. Um, and again, uh, that's only for if you've never worked for the federal government, or if you have worked, I'm sorry, for the federal government in the past. Uh, two other questions. One, have you heard of anything that to apply for post office jobs, you have to have lived in the state, states five years prior to qualifying? That I haven't heard. Um, the post office is a little bit different. Um, I don't, we don't, the post office doesn't post their positions through USA Jobs. Okay. Um, so I'm not really, sh I'm not, I'm not really sure about that um, criteria. Okay, and then a veteran question. Mm -hmm. What if your veteran service time was only training days? I'm guessing basic and AIT. Um, uh, does yeah. that still count and would that pertain to the 9-11 timeframe? Hmm. So I'm assuming that the training time was during the 9-11 timeframe. I think that most I can double check this information, but I'm pretty sure that when they're talking about time and service, it has to be active duty. Uh -huh. um, Usually, well, I think it depends on the way the grant or something's written because 180 days, usually it's about 181 mm -hmm. because basic and AIT usually comes out. That's yeah. basic training and advanced individual training comes out to about 180 days. So I'm thinking, 
Okay. Well, if that was the case, then I, I'm not sure, I guess, how long yeah. the time frame is, like you said. Right. I think they, they should just apply probably in I would say the same. So, I mean, there's not going to be, as far as the veteran preferences go, there's not going to be a job that, um, you know, it may only be for, if there's jobs that are posted specifically for veterans, let's say that's the hiring path, it's a veteran, it's for veterans only. Whether yeah. you're five or 10 point preference, you can still apply and be eligible for that position, 100%. It's okay matter of whether or not you you get the five or the 10 point preference. Um, so really in that case, I mean, I would apply anyways because you're eligible and your proof of eligibility is your DD-214. Um, and then whether or not they give you the five point preference or not, it would be at the discretion of the human resources. Okay. And then uh, a little later, if you could cover about uh, the open and close dates and Will they, when would they expect a uh, response? But I'm sure you're gonna cover that later, but. Yeah, we will talk about that. Um, okay. Yeah, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was gonna say, okay, cool, so. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, the, I mean, I can say the open and close dates will, um, I mean, they, they're really different <clears throat> for each job. And it's usually by midnight, like if the closing date was today, it would be by you know midnight tonight. So you would have the whole day to apply. If you try to apply, if the closing date's today and you try to apply tomorrow, they won't accept. I mean, you can apply and submit it, but you won't, you, you'll be turned down for the position. Um, okay. Yeah, and as far as response time goes, yes, we will talk about that. Um, patience is really the name of the game when it comes to applying for federal jobs, unfortunately. Um, I recently just had a veteran who applied for a job in October, November. And he just got called for an interview a month ago. Um, so, and, and there's kind of no telling. Um, sometimes things move faster than that, 100%. That, you know, it's not always the case that it takes that long, um, but it just kind of depends. Um, so I wish I had more of a concrete answer to give, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll let you drive on here. No problem. Um, so these are just, um, if there are any veterans who think they might qualify for five or 10 point preference, this is just a nice little reference. Um, you will have to submit a document with your application packet, which I'll talk about, um, which shows um, how you qualify for the 10 point preference. And so these are kind of the different ways that you can qualify for 10 point preference. You know, having a service connected disability of 30% or more, um, or at least 10%, but not 30%. It doesn't really, um, you know, matter in terms, it's, it's more for like how I think they're just kind of keeping track of these things. Um, you know, derived preference, so anything less than 10%. If you're a Purple Heart recipient, um, you know, receiving, you know, um, compensation, um, being a derived preference, like qualified spouses, widows, widowers, mothers of veterans. I think it's mothers of veterans whose um, uh, son or daughter is 100% service connected, I believe. I'd have to double check that. Um, and then the five point preference, again, just really need to look at the dates and, and how long you served. Um, okay, so these are the accepted hiring authorities. Um, Again, I apologize if you're a non-veteran. We'll eventually shift back, but these are just kind of important because, again, really what it comes down to is these hiring paths. And what we learn a lot about is that, again, people are either applying for jobs they don't qualify or they're missing out on opportunities because they think that they don't qualify for a certain hiring authority, but in fact they do. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Most of them are veteran specific with the exception of Schedule A. Um, and I'll go into more detail. Um, so you may see a job that's posted for um, VEOA eligible veterans, Veterans Employment Opportunity Act. Um, these are used for filling permanent competitive positions, um, allows veterans to apply for announcements that might be labeled as status or merit promotion. So, um, though that's just kind of language that's used here in the VA. Um, 
So like a career status position is like somebody who's been in a position for three or more years. Um, a merit permission, promotion would be like from one GS to the next um, level, like a nine to an 11. Um, obviously you have to be honorably discharged. Um, you have to be preference eligible um, and, and 10 points preference eligible. And you have to have served three years of continuous active duty. Um, and this does not apply. This doesn't allow you to apply for internal positions, but it does allow you to apply for, you know, a position will be labeled by the hiring path as a special hiring authority. So you'll see that it'll say like VEOA eligible veterans may apply. Um, uh, this is a 30% or more disabled veteran um, special hiring authority. Obviously, you need to have a service connected disability of 30% or more. Um, can be used for hiring of permanent or even temporary or term positions. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Some positions are posted uh, with different terms as we call them, um, permanent, temporary, um, you know, not to exceed one year or not to exceed four years. Um, no GS level limitations. So it doesn't matter, you know, you can apply for a 12, even if maybe you've only worked in the past as a GS-7, if you have prior federal experience, you're that time and grade that I was kind of briefly talking about doesn't really apply here. Um, okay. Uh, VRA, the Veterans Recruitment Act. Um, this allows agencies to appoint eligible veterans um, without competition in, in positions up to and including a GS-11. So what they mean by without competition is that means that could be like a direct hire. So for example, if there's a supervisor who's working in a department here and um, he comes to us and said, our program, I should say, our program and says, um, hey, I'm looking to fill um, a medical technician position. Um, I don't really want to post it on USA Jobs. I want to try to find some um, candidates that I can do what's called direct hire. Um, direct hire means they still have to meet the qualifications for the position. You still have to, you know, meet those minimum criteria, but you don't have to compete in that they don't have to post it through USA Jobs um, in that sense. Um, and so if I had a veteran I was working with who is VRA eligible, I could refer that person for direct hire to the supervisor. And by refer, I just mean, you know, make that connection and say, hey, here's this person's resume, here's their veteran documents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and they could interview that person and, you know, they still have to go through that process of interviewing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, that's, that's what that means by without competition. Um, and this is just the eligibility criteria, um, a recipient of a campaign badge for service during war or being a disabled veteran, a service-connected disabled veteran, um, or receiving um, the Armed, service, Armed Forces Service Medal for participation in the military, um, recently separated within three years, and obviously have to be um, under honorable conditions. Schedule A. So this is the one that's not veteran specific. This is open to the public. Um, this also allows agencies to do direct hire, as I was mentioning, where they don't have to post the job on USA Jobs per se, <clears throat> but it allows an agency to hire a person um, with a disability. Um, doesn't matter if it's physical, um, mental, emotional, cognitive, learning. Um, it's, you have to show proof of that disability, um, which just means you have to get a document, um, which is just what we call schedule a letter. <clears throat> you have to get a letter from someone like myself, a vocational rehabilitation counselor. Um, if you aren't connected with the VA, um, the Illinois Department of Human Services or Illinois Department of Rehabilitation Services, um, they have vocational rehabilitation counselors. They know what schedule a letters are they can write those for you as well. Um, you can get a doctor, uh, a, a doctor to write you a Schedule A letter, um, although you just may have to show them or explain to them like what that is. Um, and all the letter states, it doesn't identify what the disability is. The letter just states that you are a person who has a documented disability and 
you know, me, if I was writing the letter, it just says, I verify that I know that you have a disability and that you're eligible for this hiring authority. Um, the Schedule A, these, these hiring authorities we're talking about, they don't give you points, like we talked about that five and 10 points preference for the veterans. These don't give you points, but what they do is they open the door in the sense that, you know, there are jobs that are posted specifically just for, you know, people who fit this criteria. Um, so that's kind of a, a benefit, I guess. Um, so yeah, you just have to have a letter that you submit with your application. Um, and then this is disabled, this is another last uh, hiring authority. And I haven't actually met anyone who's um, been eligible for this or use this. So I'm admittedly not as familiar with it other than knowing that it exists. Um, but this is um, disabled veterans enrolled in a VA training program under the voc vocational rehabilitation program. So we have, we do vocational rehabilitation in our program at the VA. There is the Veterans Benefits Administration, so the VBA, which is in Chicago, and they have a vocational rehab and employment program. And through that program, they have funds that they can um, offer to veterans who, let's say they have an employment goal of being a teacher, they can also help to put them to school um, and provide sort of, you know, money for education. Um, because that kind of helps them meet their employment goal, right? You can't be a teacher without having the education, you know, to do that. So, um, and so after they complete their education program, um, there's, my understanding is that there are certain VA training opportunities they can do here um, that would help them to secure employment here in the system. Um, so again, I'm not, if you have more questions about it, I can try to find more answers, but I don't really, I'm not as familiar with it other than kind of that. <laughs> okay, um, this is, I think one of the last things um, I'm gonna talk about with veteran preferences and special hiring authorities and then we'll switch back um, to the job announcement. Um, so these are just some things that can influence your, your veteran's preference. So um, obviously the characterization of your discharge, um, retirement versus separation, um, those are just a little bit different. Um, different um, uh, campaign medals, expedition, other awards like the Purple Heart, um, your disability rating, um, length of active duty service, um, grade of the position you're applying for. You know, if you're a VRA eligible veteran and you're trying to apply for a GS-13, the VR your your eligibility as a as a VRA veteran doesn't help you above a GS-11. Um, so those kind of things can, can affect your um, eligibility or, or preference. Um, whether it's open to the public or other special hiring paths, um, drive preference for you know, spouses and parents, um, and just other miscellaneous, you know, the, the last one's kind of a catch-all. There's a lot of HR rules and regulations that I you know, am not familiar with, obviously, um, past kind of what we're talking about today. So. Okay, before I shift back to the job announcement, any questions so far? Sound good? Yes, uh, there's a couple. Uh, well, one person, uh, he's been in the technical field for 15 years, uh, but always gets a response that I'm not qualified. Uh, they get confused at that. So, uh, I don't know, maybe that's the resume or however they apply it could be lots of different things and you're you know it, it's unfortunate because oftentimes the letter the email you get back from hr they don't always tell you why you weren't qualified i will tell you this if you do call hr um and get a human um you can ask them and say hey i received an email that i wasn't eligible for a certain position I really felt like I hit the mark on this. You know, would you be able to just tell me why I was denied? And they will tell you. Um, I actually um, have called many a times and they've either, you know, sometimes the answer is, you know, you didn't rank high enough. Um, so we've talked about the veteran points preference. So the entire application that you submit is, um, everything is evaluated on, on points. 
okay? And so what they do is they tally up all your points for your entire application packet, everything that you've submitted. And you either get ranked in three different categories, best qualified, qualified, or least qualified. Nine times out of 10, really the only applicants that HR is sending to the, to the um, um, hiring manager is the best qualified. So sometimes you get an, a, a, um, you might get an email from HR that says you were denied for the position. And if you were to call and follow up, sometimes you just didn't rank high enough. Um, sometimes you were qualified, but you weren't ranked among the best qualified, the highest qualified. So that's, that's part of that. Um, but sometimes I've called and HR has said, um, I, we didn't fill something out correctly. Um, and so therefore, you know, we, based on that, you know, HR doesn't follow up to ask questions. So if something's not filled out correctly, um, then it's, it could be, that could turn into just a denial. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, considered a federal employee if you work for the post office? I believe so. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I think. Yeah. So. Okay. Someone is a non-clinical healthcare leader. Mm -hmm. Would they be considered if they never worked city, state or government or federal jobs? I don't think there's that requirement. You have different requirements, right? Or different ways to apply as a civilian. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. Prior federal service is not required. So, you know, here in the, in the federal system, you know, we talk about the, these GS levels, right? So the way that they kind of categorize like, and look at experience is based on, um, you know, if you're a GS nine, you might be making, what is a GS nine? I don't know, 50 to 75,000 a year or something like that. I think that might be the pay range. Um, and so that kind of, in their mind, they, they, that's equated to a certain level of experience. A GS9 typically is someone who has, I think you have a master's degree, but you might not really have um, experience. Or you can have both. You can have an equivalent. You can qualify for education, experience, or both. But when you don't work for the federal government, they do compute your civilian or your private sector time into like sort of how the VA looks at like federal service time, if that makes sense. So your experience, if you have five years experience as a social worker, that's five years of work experience um, at the VA. So that's still, that's, you know, experience is experience. So absolutely, there's, there's no requirement you have to have prior um, federal or, or state experience, government's experience. Okay, this one's kind of a long question, but I think it pertains to between veterans and civilian. Uh, former federal government employee, uh, been trying to get a job at federal government agency in Chicago. Mm -hmm. However, their positions are, are always open to general public and I can never seem to make the panel. I was told it's because veterans get preference to make the panel if they fulfill the requirements for the job. Is this true? Well, so veterans get preference in terms of those points we talked about, right? So they, they may get an extra five or 10 points added to their application because of their veteran status. So that is true. Um, but, you know, do they get preference, you know, if there's a veteran who interviewed for a job and there's a non-veteran who interviewed for a job, um, that them being a veteran doesn't automatically, you know, there's no rule or guidance that, you know, the hiring manager has to choose the veteran, I guess, if that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Okay. And then um, for multi, if they've applied for multiple positions, that doesn't disqualify them for previously applied. Nope. Okay. And then uh, just to let people know, the Secretary of State is not a federal government job. You have to apply through the state of Illinois. Okay. Uh, state, state government. And no party, uh, I'm just gonna answer some of these. Sure. I don't think party of, uh, political party affiliation influences chances of being hired. No. Uh, I don't think there's, a, no, there's, uh, there's not any age limitations, is there? Yeah, I think with, your state and federal, 
with FBI, I mean, I think there's like, you have to be like 35, but not for, for your standard, like federal agencies. No. Yeah. I know when, uh, I, I saw the state, the unemployment office, uh, back in probably around 2000 hired someone who was uh, a P-51 Mustang pilot in World War II. So for certain agencies, I don't think age matters at all. Uh, is there Schedule A for disabilities? Yes. Have you heard of that? Well, yeah, so that's what Schedule A is for, is for individuals with disabilities. So, and it can be any disability as long as it is, um, you know, a documented disability. So for example, like, you know, um, if I'm writing a Schedule A letter for a veteran, I have to be able to look in their chart and see that they have some kind of documented disability. Um, so, you know, that can be physical, emotional, mental, um, cognitive, learning. Um, I've seen Schedule A letters written for ADHD, depression, um, blindness, bipolar disorder. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty wide, uh, wide net. Um, but yeah, you just have to get a letter from your, an either a vocational rehab counselor or a doctor. Um, and again, the letter is non-disclosing. So it just says, you know, um, and I can, if, it, if anybody wants, I can send like a sample Schedule A letter um, just to show that it just says like, you know, I, Megan Straza, verify that so-and-so has a X, Y, and Z disability and they're eligible for Schedule A. That's all it says. Okay. I'm just going to answer this out loud. Uh, this webinar, although it's veterans in the beginning, this applies to everyone uh, across the board. And the final question I'm going to take at this time is, do, uh, do the federal uh, jobs have an applicant tracking system in ATS that's looking for keywords and no, there's, there's actual humans who are going through your, your uh, packet. There's the HR people. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> okay. That All right. Why it's so slow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you carry on and we'll answer some more questions a little later. Sounds good. So we're going to shift. You're right. So we're, we're kind of past now the, the hiring preferences and the, um, the veteran preferences and things like that. Again, that just kind of was tied to the different hiring paths and kind of first figuring out like, do I qualify? So this is what a job announcement looks like. So I just put in a random job search for a correction officer. So we're gonna kind of talk about what we're looking at here. So you're gonna see uh, the open and closing dates as we talked about. Um, that just means that's the time frame you have to apply. Anything before or after, or well, not before that, but anything after that would not be considered. Um, the pay scale is listed. Um, so this one is a GL 6-7. I'm not really sure where the GL is. Some agencies kind of use something a little bit different, but generally the GS is what you see. Um, so you can see positions that might be posted um, as like a GS 9-11. What that means is that the position has promotional potential. So you could get hired as a GS 9, but then after your first year of working as a GS-9, then you can get promoted to the GS-11, assuming you're doing satisfactory work. Um, if you're not familiar with the GS pay scales, you'll see I have an arrow here pointing to salary that kind of tells you what that salary is for that pay scale. Um, if you're also curious, everything in the federal government is public knowledge. So you could actually go on Google and Google like um, o OPM is kind of what we use, o Office of Personnel Management, um, OPM pay scale, um, and, or 2020, because it does change every year because there's locality pay that's kind of, um, that, that we get each year. Um, but if you wanted to kind of take a look at like what all that is, you'll get a chart. Um, and you have to kind of find the Chicagoland region, but then you'll get a, a chart of all the different pay scales just to give you an idea if you're curious. Um, you'll see appointment type on the job announcement. Um, this one is permanent, but again, some are temp, some are, um, you know, term, so not to exceed a certain time. They'll tell you on the appointment type, they'll list, like if it's not to exceed one year, they'll, they'll put that out there. 
um, work schedule. And then obviously on the right hand side here, you're going to see it says this job is open too. So there are those hiring paths again. If you're not sure, make sure you read that and you see, um, you know, who, it'll, it'll tell you who's eligible. If you want more information, just click on it. Um, and we're gonna look at like location, the duties, requirements, um, and other documents we need. Um, these again are those appointment types. This is more just kind of informational. These are just kind of some different language you might see in the job announcement. Um, if something is a career position or a career conditional or not, non-temporary, um, has a not to exceed date associated with it. Um, again, this is just more informational for you. Um, this is um, qualifications. So like I was saying, some positions can be posted as two different GS or in this situation, a GL level. So this is a six slash seven position. So they'll tell you, if you want to apply as a six, this is how, what you need to qualify. If you want to apply as a seven, this is what you need to qualify. When you go through the application process, they will ask you, are you applying as a GS six and do you meet the criteria for that? Are you applying as a GS seven? Do you meet the criteria for that? You can apply for one or the other and you can apply for both. So it's up to you. Um, you can get denied for the seven and still get qualified for the six. So if you get an email, let's say you apply for both GS levels, make sure you're looking in that email, if you get like a rejection email, which GS level you might have been rejected for. Because even though you get rejected for one, you could be still eligible for the other. Um, over on the right hand side here, I just have that little bit of info about like, what does this time and grade thing mean? So um, it's a requirement that applies to the promotion of current and federal uh, or in former federal employees. Um, again, oops, excuse me, <laughs> have to do an update soon. <laughs> um, uh, that you must have served at the, at the next lower grade level in order to apply for, again, this certain position. So if you are applying for an 11, you need to have worked as a nine for at least one year. If you've never had any federal service employment at all, this does, this is insignificant. Um, then this is just more information for you. Sometimes these job announcements, it's more just understanding what it is, even if it doesn't apply for you so that you know that, well, this applies or it doesn't apply or how does this affect me? Maybe it doesn't. Um, it's just a lot of information they put out there. Okay. Um, on the job announcement, you know, they'll go through and they'll tell you all the required documents you need for the position. So make sure to look that over closely. Um, and then you're ready to apply. So we're finally there. Um, so you will go through and um, start the application process. You click apply. By this time, you have already, you should, you, well, yeah, you should have already uploaded your re when you created your profile, you should have already uploaded your resume and then whatever other documents you want to just kind of have in your profile. So things that most people put in their documents upload file um, might be transcripts, um, DD-214, uh, Schedule A letter. Um, if you have, and we'll talk about this with the 10-point veteran preference, if you have an award letter, so if you're trying to get 10 points, you're a service-connected disabled veteran, you need to also submit your award letter that says, you know, you are a 30, you, you get a benefit of 30% or whatever it might be. Um, so those documents should be uploaded. So what's nice is um, you'll just, you can either use the resume builder that's in USA Jobs. I'm not a big fan of that myself. So I usually just upload whatever resume I have or my veterans are working with. Um, and so you'll just select your resume. These are documents, these are miscellaneous documents I put into a folder. Um, you're just clicking and selecting what you want to um, put in your, in your application. Documents that you might need if you're applying for preference or special hiring authority. If you're trying to get five-point preference, all you need to upload is your DD-214. There's no other forms. 
if you're applying for 10 point preference, you need your DD-214, that award letter I mentioned, and you need what's called an SF-15 form. Um, I'll show you a sample on the next slide of just what that looks like. You can Google that as well. All of VA forms are Googleable. It's all public information. Um, if you're applying for the VRA or the VEOA eligible um, hiring authorities, all you need is your DD-214. And then if you're using the Schedule A, all you need is that letter I mentioned verifying that you are a person with a disability. This is what that SF-15 form looks like. Um, and this is where you're just gonna check off, um, I, I don't know if you remember early on, I showed you that chart. You're just gonna kind of check off how, how are you eligible as a 10 point preference veteran? What is your um, compensation or preference? So then you'll review your package. So you've uploaded your resume, you've uploaded your documents, you've selected them, we're reviewing it. You're gonna have an opportunity to, you know, include your demographic information if you want. Then you're gonna check this little box to certify that everything you submitted is, you know, the truth <laughs> and is accurate. And then from there, you're gonna to go to what's called the application manager. So you actually then go to whatever the agency application is. Um, so it's a separate federal system. It's automatically connected to USA Jobs. So some of the information that you put into your profile early on is gonna auto populate into this application manager. And you'll see that as we kind of go through. Whoops. Um, okay. So you'll see they'll ask you again about veterans preference. It should already be selected for you because again, it's pulling that information from your profile. You'll see on the right hand side, I know it's a little bit small and it's not super clear, but my name is in there, my address. Um, that information again was pulled from my profile. So that's, you just kind of verifying that. Then you're gonna have to do what's called the assessment. And that's, it's, some assessments are super short. Um, I've never seen one that's painfully long. They're usually not more than like, I don't know like maybe 15 questions, I would say. Um, you do have the opportunity to view this assessment before you even apply. So when you're going, when you're at the job announcement and you're looking under, there's a tab that uh, says uh, how you will be evaluated. There's a link uh, under that tab that says, um, I don't know exactly what it says, but it's something about, you know, the, you'll be evaluated based on this criteria or based on this assessment. So it's good to look at that before you actually submit um, your uh, application packet because you can look at that assessment and kind of tweak your resume and kind of know like, well, this is what I'm gonna be evaluated on. This is what they're looking for. Um, most times the assessment is multiple choice. Um, so this is a really simple example I put up here. It's, it was like for a housekeeping position. So you'll see something like this, like for each of the task statements, choose one response from the list below that best describes your experience. So like, you know, you'll have to rank yourself from A, having no experience doing that job at all, all the way through E, being an expert. My advice is always this. I will never encourage anyone to falsify their level of experience or expertise, but now is not the time to be humble. <laughs> so if you know you don't need 20 years experience to be an expert, rank yourself as high as you feel comfortable because this is really what HR is going to use um, as one of their tools to um, assign you points and evaluate whether you fall into that best qualified, qualified, or least qualified. Don't be shy about marking yourself as an expert if you have, you know, years of experience doing a certain job. Um, so yeah, obviously if you've never done it, you know, be honest, but you know, rank yourself as high as you can and make sure that your resume reflects that too. You know, in the same note, they will cross check this assessment with your resume. So if you're ranking yourself as an expert and everything, but you have, less than a year or one year of experience, 
doing a certain uh, task, then they're going to see that that's that's incongruent, right? That's not that's not consistent. So um, so they will they will look at that. Any questions before I keep moving? Okay. Let me see through here. Uh, when applying for a VA job, how do you get VRA applied to the application resume? I think you just covered that. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that too. We're going to talk about the federal resume, and I'll mention how to um, I, how to put that out there. How to identify? Okay. Uh, can someone get a federal job as a permanent resident green card holder? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I believe so. Um, let me ask. Um, permanent. I'm just making a note for myself. Um, if we if we can get that person's like email address or something, I can try to find out a concrete answer. I believe the answer is yes, but I want to be for sure. Um, well, why don't they email you? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like if we are, yeah. yeah, that works. Have that person. Okay. You need. Yeah. Are you going to be showing the legend for GS designations? And I'm thinking that's the pay levels, pay grades. I don't have it as part of my presentation. Um, I can go to Google and, and pull it up and kind of show you. Um, but yeah, all I put in and I can, yeah, I mean, we can do that too. That's fine. Okay. Uh, legend. I think also if you want to see a sample of the schedule a form, uh, the, they should contact you directly. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the work experience criteria for meeting various GS levels, I think that depends on what you just said, how you qualify yourself. Is that right? Um, yes, I'm sorry, repeat the question. What is the work experience criteria for meeting the various GS levels? Well, you know, they'll tell you on the, um, under um, how you will be evaluated um, or the eligibility. Um, they will tell you, like, for a GS-9, I, you know, they may say, like, you know, you either need a master's degree or you need X amount of years of experience or you need a master's degree and certain years of experience. They'll tell you exactly how many years they're really looking for for that level that you're applying for. Okay. Uh, do you still have to write the KSA essays on the applications? No! Uh, finally, <laughs> okay. Okay. How do you filter job postings for remote positions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually don't know um, how to filter. Um, if that person wants to shoot me an email, I'll also try to find an answer for that. Um, okay. I haven't seen many remote positions, so I'm really not sure. Um, okay. There's a couple GS level uh, questions. Uh, one is, do you have to list the desired GS level on your resume cover letter or both? No. no? Okay. Is it better to apply to a position at two different GS levels? Uh, like, I was last employed as a GS-12. Should I apply for just GS-12 positions? I mean, I, I, it depends on, you know, that's, it kind of depends, you know, it depends what it is that you're looking for. Um, it depends what your financial circumstances are. Um, I always say it's not a bad idea to cast a wide net um, and apply for, you know, 11s, you know, knowing that, you know, you have the promotional potential to get back to the 12. Um, I've had p people who had, um, 11 positions and left the VA and they came back and they started at sevens um, just because they wanted to get back in the federal system and they kind of they knew that that was going to just be there was just going to be time that they were going to have to take like you know um, and that they would and they eventually got back to the 11. Um, so I think it kind of depends you know uh, you know if you're in a certain financial situation where you can't or don't want to take, you know, less than a 12 and you want to try to stay within that range, then 
obviously, you know, that's, you know, that's going to kind of guide things a little bit, but it doesn't hurt you, I guess is, is what I mean. I've seen a lot of people leave and come back and they've come back at a lower level knowing that they would eventually just, you know, work their way up either through that position, through a new position they applied for, maybe it has promotional potential or otherwise it's just much easier to move around inside once you get in. So. <clears throat> well, wouldn't, if this person was a GS 12, uh, wouldn't they, if they took a GS9, wouldn't their pay scale be at, because there's, isn't there like nine or 10 different pay scales within the GS9? Would they come in at that GS12 pay scale level? Well, so it's a good question. So within each pay scale, so a GS, let's just take a GS9, right? So within each one, there's 10 steps. So it's a ladder and it's supposed to be in, and it's fixed. So um, each year is, it's the same for everybody. So like if I come in at a GS nine, the first three years, I can expect to get what's called a step increase. So the first three years, I'm going to get a slight bump in pay um, as my step increases. Then I think they skip year four, you don't get any step increase. And then I think like year five, you get a step. So anyway, so when you see those pay ranges, like 40 to 75,000 a year, that includes like, or, or 50 to 75,000. If 50 is the low end, that's a GS whatever step one. If 75 is the high end, that's a, that GS level is like step 10. Typically that's, Again, it's fixed in what years you get it, but it's spread out over a certain number of years because it's ideally supposed to be like a, a career ladder, if you will. So if someone comes in at a GS9 and they've previously worked as a GS12, they're, they might come in at a higher step. You can come in at like a GS9 step 11 or step 10. Um, you have to negotiate that with HR when you get a job offer, but it may not be, it won't be equivalent to what your GS 12 salary would be. Cause I don't think a nine and a 12, for example, have any crossover. Um, and now an 11 and a 12 might have some crossover. So if he had a GS or he or she had a GS 11 position and he came in at a, you know, GS 11 step 10, he might be pretty close to what a GS 12 step one would be um but it probably you know yeah if that makes sense okay and the following the last question we'll talk at this time is uh from africa uh anderson does the va have programs for employment for nursing students oh um that is a good question i don't know um please. like for internships or uh, I, I don't know. So, uh, okay. It, it, uh, if he or she wants to shoot me an email, um, I can, again, I don't always have the answers, but I, I'm a resourceful lady, so I can try to find out for you. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Uh, I think we'll move on. Uh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, if it's specific, I think, uh, they can contact you. Uh, but why don't you go on and we'll see what other questions come up, okay? Sounds good, thank you. Um, so this, um, I know this might be a little bit challenging to read um, and I apologize for that. The only reason I took these screenshots was just to show you what it looks like. If you're applying for a position that has two different GS levels, this is what they're going to um, ask you. They're gonna say like, to meet the basic requirement for the, I put in a recreation therapist position. You know, you have to select like, yes, I have a bachelor's degree. Maybe you are someone who, um, you know, has a bachelor's degree in a specific field. Um, so you're gonna kind of identify that, um, what your qualifications are. Um, they're going to ask you uh, if you're applying as a GS9, do you meet those qualifications if you're applying at a different GS level? So it's going to seem wordy, but that's really just what they're asking is, you know, do you qualify for the different GS levels you're applying for? And if you don't, it's okay to say no if, you know, you're applying for 
you know, if you're only applying for a nine and you don't qualify for the 11, then it's okay to say, no, I don't qualify for the 11. So, um, okay. So then you're uploading your documents um, and, and your, your submittings, um, your application. So whew, it's done, you've sent it. Um, you can go to your applications on your homepage and you can review all the applications you've submitted. You can check the status. Um, it may or may not be, I mean, this, this is kind of what it looks like. This will be two applications you've submitted. Like for these, I'll say incomplete because I didn't obviously complete the, the applications. I just did them for this presentation. But, um, and they'll tell you, we'll go over what the statuses are, but they'll tell you um, where it is in the process. Uh, you can open it up if you wanted to see more information about the job too. Okay, so what's my status? So I'll just show you right now. I'll go to the next one too. There's a lot of different statuses you can get, um, but the ones that really matter. So received, we want to know that it was received, that it's being reviewed, and that you were referred. The, this is the most important one because if you meet the best qualifications and your application got sent to the hiring manager, which is what we want, then you will see this in your status that you were referred. Um, obviously, there's other ones here, selected, hired, you know, in progress, incomplete, all that kind of stuff, but excuse me, or not selected or not hired. Um, and these are all on USA Jobs as well. So you can um, uh, see what they what the different statuses mean as well. So what happens next? So I talked a little bit about this before. So a human resource specialist is going to get your application. They're going to review all of your requirements. They're going to review your quali um, qualifications. They're going to evaluate your, your self-assessment. They're going to cross that, check that with your resume. And they're going to send those best qualified on to the hiring manager. The hiring manager from there then decides if he wants to interview all of the best qualified, some of the best qualified, um, it's you know kind of a little bit different depending on how the positions are coded and that's kind of more of an HR thing. But, um, um, and then if you do get an interview and we'll kind of talk about what that looks like too, HR is going to be the one that extends the job offer. Um, you won't hear from the hiring manager again after the interview, the HR has to be the one to make the offer, so. Um, and then you'll go through a background investigation, all of that, and maybe get a final job offer. So the federal resume, um, it looks a little bit different. Um, I did send a sample one and I've got a couple more that are also here um, in the presentation. So this is kind of just a general federal, federal resume checklist. Because they ask for more information, it can be longer than what you're used to in a resume. It can be three to five pages in length. HR didn't always used to have that requirement. It used to just kind of be open, but then I think they were getting some 15 page resumes and said, that's too much. Um, but these are just kind of some things you want to include. Most of it is stuff you would put in your regular resume as well. So accomplishments um, from jobs um, that, you've, that you've had, um, you know, the format, is it in a, you know, they're gonna look at like how it's formatted. Um, you have to include certain information in your work history, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, making sure that your type font is just easily readable, that it flows well, um, you know, that you're not using all sorts of different crazy colors, things like that. Um, make sure you use keywords. That's the biggest, biggest, biggest thing. HR does not, we don't have an application tracking system, but HR does not know what you do. HR doesn't know what these jobs specifically are. So we can't rely on HR to infer knowledge from our resume that would be applicable to the position. So if you're interested in a job, my recommendation is to go through the job announcement, look at what the job duties are and look at that um, questionnaire I was telling you about um, under the like how you will be evaluated. There's, I was telling you the assessment, you can kind of pre see that before you actually apply for the job. Go through those two things and tweak your resume. 
make sure that your resume reflects the language that's in the job announcement because that's what they're going to do just like an ats would do they're going to look for what are the keywords what are the highlights and they're gonna look for that. So as much as it might seem obnoxious to like maybe you feel like you're being redundant or you're using the same language kind of over and over and over, in their minds, that's how they equate like, okay, you said you had five years experience, um, you know, as a, a social worker, um, then I wanna see words like intakes, assessments, screenings, yada, yada, yada for, throughout your resume. You know, that's how they're gonna say like, well, in all these different jobs, you know, might say a lot of very similar things, but if you're using those keywords and highlights, that's, that's how they're saying you have this much, ex, you know, uh, X amount of experience, years of experience. So um, anyway, so don't worry about being redundant. Use the language that's in the job announcement. Um, you want to make sure that you really accurately show that you have the experience for the position. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like most places, they only require the last 10 years of experience. Um, so if you're already at four, four or five pages, then, you know, cut off, you know, if you have like, and you still have more years experience to include, cut off those other years of experience. You know, as long as you have 10 years, you're fine. If you're only at like two pages and you have experience that goes beyond the last 10 years and you think it would be valuable, well then feel free to include it. The point is we wanna at least capture the last 10 years. That's a, at the very minimum that's required. And we wanna stay within that five page maximum. So. If you're at, like I said, two or three pages, but you have more to include, feel free to include it too. Um, obviously, um, you wanna target your resume um, to the position. Um, we're gonna talk about work duties. Um, you need to include like more information for each position. So we're gonna talk about salary. Um, here's a nice little checklist here under work experience. So obviously most places it's dates of employment, the job title, where you worked, um, the location, but we also need the address and the phone number of that place of employment, the salary, and the hours worked per week. So was it full-time 40 hours? Was it part-time 20 hours? Um, and then you have to list the supervisor's name and whether or not they can be contacted and their phone number. Um, if you're currently working somewhere and you know, they're not gonna contact anybody until um, they've already, you've already been interviewed and they're you know, starting to do the offer and things like that. But if you're concerned about, you, know, you can always put like, may contact upon a tentative offer, things like that, that would be fine. If you don't remember a supervisor's name um, or they don't work there or they're deceased or whatever, um, just put, you know, don't recall, supervisor doesn't work there anymore, but, you know, may contact the employer and still put the employer's phone number. Um, as long as there's something filled in, just don't leave it blank. Um, if the business closed, still include all the information that you know. Um, I've had to Google a fair number of um, addresses and phone numbers for employers over the years. <clears throat> Um, and just put somewhere in parentheses like business closed or, you know, um, as long as it's not left blank. So um, personal information you'd include will all be the same as a normal resume. Um, you know, how can they get in contact with you? Um, I'll show you on the resume how I would include those special hiring authority or veterans preference. Um, you can, you know, use an objective statement if you want or a professional summary. Um, highlighting kind of the skills and strengths. Um, I'm a big fan of, of using those in my resumes when I'm working with folks. Um, so yeah, another stuff is just kind of usual. Um, kind of no one size fits all. You can do a traditional chronological resume, which is, you know, a pr pretty standard format. Um, you can do more of a functional resume that kind of focuses on highlighting your skills, abilities, and your accomplishments. Um, and kind of can do a combination of both um, or like a targeted resume, which is <clears throat> kind of what we were talking about. 
And it can be a pain in the butt um, if you're applying for jobs that are like in different industries. Um, but I would tweak your resume for each job that you apply. Um, you don't have to make big changes, but again, you're just wanting to make sure that whatever specific keywords are used in the job announcement, that we're finding that in your resume too. Um, this is just normal stuff. I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, but this is just like, you know, normal resume writing stuff. You know, kind of having consistent margins, not having drastic or really decorative fonts, um, being consistent with your font throughout your resume, 10 to 12 point font, um, you know, color, you know, I, I'm only, I still am only a fan of, of black font. Um, I think that if we start to get too fancy or too colorful, I think it, it's a distraction personally. Um, but everyone's kind of got a different school of thought on that. So um, just make sure it looks clean and presentable, um, you know, and that the information that they need to find is easy to find. Um, <clears throat> so this is just one sample of a resume. Disregard that the top of the resume says social security number. Back in the day, that used to be, <clears throat> excuse me, that used to be the format was to add your social security number to the resume. That is no longer recommended. They don't want that, so don't do that. Um, but you'll see here that I have a header, and then as well, um, under their name, phone number, and address, I have included this person's 10 points veteran preference and their schedule A and VRA eligible. So that's all you have to do to document that. If you're VEOA eligible or 30% or more disabled veteran eligible, you can include that um, here as well and just put that at the top of your resume there. Um, and you'll see how I set up. So here, this person was applying for like a motorcycle tech position. So we just kind of highlighted specific skills that were relevant to the job. Um, and then you'll see here under his employer, this is kind of how I tend to set up um, someone's uh, work history for each job. Um, so you'll see address, phone number. For this one, he was self-employed, um, that they may contact. And salary, you'll see, I mean, just, you know, you can be creative, varied by job. Or if you worked in sales, you know, find an average of what the salary was. It's okay if it's not exactly accurate. Um, what they're really going to be looking for when they do their employment verification is, did you work where you said you worked, you know, from this date to this date? You know, they're kind of looking for, um, they just say you were um, uh, accurate and that you were truthful about your employment history. <clears throat> This one is um, a little bit different that I had done that you, you can also do. Um, so I, this is kind of a, a combination of a functional and a chronological resume. So I worked with a veteran who had a bachelor's degree in IT, um, but he hadn't worked in the IT field probably in about, I don't know, five to seven years when I was working with him. Uh, he was currently, <clears throat> excuse me, working at Mariano's and then we got him a job um, at the Naperville Public Library. Um, and so if I kind of think myself that the most important information should be on the first page to, to, to what is reasonable, right? So if you need education as part of your position, that should be on the first page. Um, I think pertinent work history, if you can have it be as much on the first page as possible, that's also awesome. So what I did here was, you know, he hadn't worked in IT in a few years. And if you looked at his first, if you were to look at his resume, if we had just done a chronological, you would have seen that his, his most recent, like three jobs were like, they were Mariano's, they were, um, I don't know, there was another job that he worked, they weren't in the IT field at all. And I didn't want HR to get discouraged by that. So. What I did was I made a header that said relevant IT experience, and then I did that in chronological order. And then I made another header after that that just said um, other professional experience, and then I did that in chronological order. So <clears throat> at least they were able to see this is all the IT experience that this person has, which is the bulk of how, what we're using to qualify for the position. So that's something if you're, you know, trying to get back into a field or you've kind of been out of work for a while for whatever reason, 
Um, that's just another idea. Um, and again, I'm a big fan of doing like a, a profile summary or a summary of qualifications. And I tend to tweak that summary of qualifications um, most often with each job that we're applying for. And this is just a functional skills resume I done with someone. It's not necessarily in federal format, but this is just an example of what that really means. You know, these are kind of automotive warehouse and custodial were sort of bulk um, were of his work history. Those are the industries he worked with. Um, and so we kind of focused on what the skills were in those different industries and then just listed his professional experience um, separately. So just another way to, to do it. Um, and you could do that in fed, for a federal resume, as long as the professional experience um, on, for each employer, you had all of the information that you need, address, phone number, supervisor, all that stuff, so. Okay, this is kind of just some general stuff. I'm sure stuff that Jim Frugal's talked about if you've been in any of his workshops before too. Um, just some things about writing an effective resume um, highlighting achievements, contributions, et cetera. Um, one thing that we've heard back at least from HR people, both in the federal system and not, about why people don't get promotions, um, promotional positions, is because <clears throat> they're writing their resume and they're only really kind of documenting, well, like, these are what my job duties were. But if you're applying for a higher level position, they want to see well, what are the extras that you've done? What are some of the above and beyonds that you've done? You know, what are some of the higher level skills that you've done in this job um, that maybe weren't required for this job, but those are the things that are gonna show that, you know, you're ready for something that is higher level um, in responsibility as well. So don't, you know, including those things too, trying to kind of highlight those um, extras and achievements as much as possible. Um, Presenting information strategically, again, the key words, don't assume that they know anything. Um, I don't overuse acronyms, jargon, things like that, um, you know, because HR, again, they don't know what you do, right? They're looking at what the hiring manager wants <clears throat> and they're looking at what your resume says. Um, so don't rely on them to infer. Um, I personally put the job title first because I think that's more important than where you worked. If I'm trying to see that someone had so many years of project management experience, I'm first inclined to look at, well, I wanna see the words project manager in their resume somewhere. I'm not necessarily looking for, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in where they worked, but not primarily. Um, if you have big gaps in your work history, um, you might wanna be a little bit more creative with how you're um, listing your skills um, and your experience in education and things like that, because um, you don't wanna necessarily highlight those gaps. Um, or being creative. I've had people put, you know, they were just out of work for a few years, but they did work with their uncle or their dad, um, you know, doing drywall or painting or, you know, maybe it was even just to help out or they were working for a case of beer, they weren't really getting like an income. I would still put that on there um, as like self-employed handyman, you know, or if you were caretaking for a family member, um, don't underestimate that there are skills and value to um, those experiences. Um, again, trying to keep your work history in the last 10 years. Um, I've had new graduates um, or people who are trying to break into a field and they're kind of having a hard time, list uh, relevant college courses you took, trainings, workshops, um, if you worked on spe special projects, things like that, um, anything to just kind of highlight that you have a certain knowledge base that you bring to the table. Um, and then these are just kind of some other things, like if you're kind of having a hard time coming up with like accomplishments or kind of need other material to draw from, you know, these are just some other ideas you can look to. So like former job descriptions, supervisory reviews or feedback. Um, I've even put on resumes before, um, you know, supervisory feedback um, was, you know, whatever it was, you know. Um, or received acknowledgement from supervisor on, you know, whatever it was. 
Um, so, you know, feel free to include that too. Um, awards, acknowledgements, recognitions, any special assignments, volunteer experience. I think volunteer is also valuable. Um, I think that all those things, you know, you, we don't want people to wonder what, what you've done with the um, gaps in your work history. So they want to know kind of, you know, how have you filled that time? Volunteering again, taking care of family, what, what was going on? So if you're able to f put that in there, that's great. That's helpful. Um, okay. Anything before I move on to the performance-based interviewing? Am I moving too fast, too slow? A couple questions uh, about several people brought this up. Okay. <clears throat> uh, for Maureen and Christine, uh, salary. In Illinois, you can't ask salary history, uh, but this is a federal application, so do you have to list the salary history? Yes. Okay. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Question. <laughs> federal outranks state, I guess. Okay. Um, if someone uploads their resume to the profile, do they still have to complete the education and work history section of the profile? Good Mark. Um, I, I get a little bit lazy with that because, because I, again, the employers don't, I mean, the agencies don't see that. Um, so no, I, I don't think so. The only place I've been caught up on the creating the profile, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, it is to your benefit to identify your preferences. They'll ask you, you'll be given a list of like the different hiring paths and you can select like what you essentially like qualify for or would be eligible for. Um, and your veteran information. Um, I have uh, one time went through an application and we didn't put in the veteran information and we tried to go through. And then when we got to the application manager, where it was auto-populating things, you're not able to change the information that's auto-populated from USA Jobs. So if you chose not to identify your veteran preference, you can't later go back and change that. So just make sure that's done. Um, but I don't think I've ever uh, had an issue with not completing work history and education. Okay, um, I think you kind of covered this, but Susan asked, should skills such as Excel be listed under each position where the skill is used? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, positions in U.S. Embassy are considered federal jobs. This is by Arshed. Uh, where would you find jobs for embassy or ambassador positions or embassy positions? That is a good question. Um, I think the State Department would probably be there, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. I've certainly never seen them on USA Jobs, but I can't say I've had anyone that's been looking at those positions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a clear answer. Okay, uh, Thomas asks, are federal jobs linked to Illinois Job Link? I don't think so. Okay, we talked about salary. Uh, if the supervisor is no longer working at the previous job, but you have their cell and have given them permission to be contacted, do you give that info on the application? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, I once applied for census job. This is from Paul and went through the background check. How could this background check help me applying for government jobs? Um, it I really does. I don't I don't know that it does. Um, I mean, it helps you in that if you if you cleared the background and that all went smooth, then you can expect it probably will will be that way here when you go through this background check. I guess if I guess it doesn't. It, I don't think it's advantageous necessarily to add that to like your resume um, as like previously cleared. You know, uh, you know, government background check or something like that. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> okay, so I guess we're back to salary with Julie and an anonymous. Are you required to include hourly and annual salary for each job? And then the second person asks, there's a law in Illinois uh, that says you can't ask, uh, could you discuss this? Again, I think, this federal is me, federal out, 
weighs the state. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So federal federal is going to trump the state, um, and that's the federal requirement. So unfortunately, that's you know needs to be listed. The nice thing about um, applying for a federal position, and I think some of where at least my understanding with um, the benefit of not doing it in the private sector is like, we don't always, when we're applying in the private sector, we don't always know what the salary is offered for the job. That's not always information that's disclosed up front. Um, we're just kind of given an arbitrary, like, well, it depends on your experience, right? And that kind of can, um, you know, open the door for things. So here is a little bit different just because when you're applying for a federal position, you already know exactly what it pays you already know the range is going to be 50 to whatever. Um, whether they give you a GS9 step one or a GS9 step three is really kind of dependent on how much experience you have, not dependent on how much you've earned in the past. So even though you have to list it, it it's not really valuable in helping them figure out what their offer is going to be to you, if that makes sense. Um, most people come in at step one in whatever the GS level is. Um, of course, you can negotiate, like I said, to get a higher step and uh, to come in at a higher um, step level. But, um, but yeah, so if that's a concern, um, I guess there's some, some benefit to that is, you know, you kind of know the salary up front, um, you know, and so, your your salary doesn't really impact the range that they're going to offer you or what they can offer you. Um, so, um, and then, so there was that, I remember. Oh, and then uh, there was something about hourly versus annually. You can list your salary either way, um, whether it's hourly or annually. You don't have to list both, but either one is fine. Okay, and Susan asked, should volunteer work be called volunteer work? Um, yeah, I would probably create a separate header for that that said volunteer experience. Okay, and what is the biggest error you see people making on the application? It's mm, a good question. Um, probably just the questions sometimes can be lengthy and wordy. Um, and so sometimes we might click no when we really mean yes or you know people are afraid to click click that they don't qualify for something like i had mentioned if you apply for a gs9 slash 11 it's okay to say i'm not that i don't qualify for the 11 um because you are qualifying for the nine um it feels kind of odd you know because in an application we want to you know put our best foot forward and we want to be um we kind of don't want to i think uh say that we aren't qualifying for something, but um, it's appropriate to do that in that situation. Um, so I think just reading the questions thoroughly um, is one. And the second would be, well, actually, I would say there's three. So reading the questions thoroughly um, and making sure you're answering them correctly. Um, the second thing I would say is a big mistake is people don't put in keywords in their resume from the job announcement. The language in the job announcement should absolutely be reflected in your resume. That's huge um because that's how you're getting evaluated um and then the third um mistake i was gonna say and it just escaped me um i don't remember if it comes back to me i'll let you know <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah the resume and having those keywords um is is, is a big one um and then yeah answering things correctly Okay, uh, Timothy asked, two of the companies I previously worked for are no longer exist. You know, they went out of business or were purchased and absorbed. Any advice on how to handle that? I, I would just, you know, list um, what, inform, you know, the information about the company. Um, if you have address and phone number, list that. I always just put like, I'll put what my job title was with the company. Um, and I'll put the name of the employer and then in parentheses, I'll put business closed. That's just what I do. Um, if it was so many years ago and I don't really remember the full address um, and I can't Google them, I can't find them anywhere. I've run into that before. 
Um, I've just put in under, you know, where I would put phone number. I I'll put phone and a semicolon, and then I'll just put don't recall or business closed. Um, same with address. Um, so as long as, again, as long as you're filling out something, um, it's, it's okay. If someone worked on the 200 and 2010 census, are they considered a formal federal employee? Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll answer this question in two ways. I, so a being a former federal employee, um, that is in, in for, for in your entire career. So there's no like expiration date on that. So even if you were a former federal employee and it was 15 years ago, that's okay. Um, you, you're, you would still be, you know, eligible for um, any, anything that would, you know, be pertinent to someone who is a for, former federal employee. What you need to do is, um, shoot, it's going to restart me. Um, sorry, I just had a pop up for an update. What a horrible time. <laughs> um, um, what you need to do is um, uh, have an SF-50 though. If you were a former federal employee, um, you can include your SF-50. That is a form that is um, your document that, um, it's like your HR document that says, this was the last job title you had, this was the GS level that you had. Um, and you submit that with your application. Okay. This is, well, okay. So long question. If only the first 50 applications are accepted and the job opens at 11 p.m. Central Standard and there is no time to customize the resume, should one apply with a general resume and then try to edit the application later and replace the general ed resume with a custom resume as soon as possible. Is speed more important than customization? Um, so, so this would be going in after the closing date and the closing time, right? To edit the resume, it sounds like. Um, I'm thinking it, it's the ending because it, but it says opening. Uh, uh, I don't know, it's Igor. I, I think it's, it's not admin. I, I would only apply when you can submit everything that that um, because if you if you apply and you submit it and they're only taking the first fifty applications and if they close it before you have the opportunity to submit your um, your updated or customized resume, well then the resume they have is the one that's not cust you know what I'm saying. Um, so I don't know that that's necessarily advantageous. Uh, on the re resume, how many bullet points or bullet point job tests do you think are enough? It's from Christina. Um, I don't think that there's like a limit or, or there's a too much. Um, I definitely think, you know, you have to show your experience. So that is going to be um, however many bullet points you need to document that you have um, the experience. Um, I've had jobs that I've, uh, I've had resumes I've done for folks and I've had uh, 12 bullet points under there. Um, they worked in the job for a number of years. They you know, had special projects. They had things that were important to put in there. So we put it in there. Okay, uh, and I think the same would go with uh, someone had a business and it closed. Uh, how to, can they list their experience? Well, you would list your experience um, the same as you would uh, for any um, for any job. Um, it really just comes with um, yeah. I would just list your experience like you would any job. Um, whether it closed or not is kind of irrelevant. That experience is still valuable. The skills are still there. Um, uh, I, Jim, I, apo I apologize. I'm going to jo join this meeting from my laptop because unfortunately the VA has decided to reboot my computer in about a minute to do an update. Okay. Uh -huh, I apologize. Um, I'm going to, can I, can I get two minutes and I'm going to just pop on my laptop here? Sure. That's okay. I, can address some issues and uh, 
I'll do some other things while you're doing that. I'll just uh, look at, I'll share my screen. Thanks, I'll stop sharing. I just need five minutes, I apologize. I'm gonna log into my, uh, to my Mac. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All righty, let's get here. Okay, hopefully. So while uh, Megan's uh, talking here, I would like want to talk about. Uh, oops. One of the success stories that came in is um, I'm going to just use her initials RS. Uh, she had been at home uh, 20 years raising her children. Uh, her previous career 20 years ago had been as a senior business analyst and she came into our center. She used the work not uh, job search workshops. We funded her for retraining with certifications in business analysis, a Six Sigma green belt, scrum master and scrum product owner. Uh, she did attend uh, not only uh, work nets job clubs, but other job clubs. Uh, we talked about, uh, we had told her about there were things like returnships, uh, kind of like internships as well, uh, which she did with a business analyst and data analytics position. And then she just got a job offer with business analytics. So uh, you do have to get out there. Uh, I just wanted to list, this is everything that I know of, of her, uh, but you have to look at that there was a lot of activity there uh, that she did. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I haven't had experience for 20 years. Uh, you do have experience. You don't lose that experience. It's going to be, how do I upgrade my skills? How do I upgrade my job search? Uh, and, and mainly uh, when, when I see uh, this person's LinkedIn profile, uh, she talked to a lot of people because a lot of people uh, have been congratulating her and so if you stay isolated, people are not going to know that you need help. And a lot of people, both herself and other people, shared information. So I, I feel that's important for you. Um, just one more thing uh, here is those of you, if you have to leave uh, and you are working with a, a counselor, a career counselor here, this is the code that you would email to your counselor, uh, US Fed 302, USFED 302. Veterans, Uniform, Sierra, uh, Foxtrot, Echo, Delta 302. So you just email that to them. We will be uh, giving a, an attendance roster, but if you have to leave now, I figured I would get that out there to you. And then coming up in the job clubs, June 5th, I will be breaking down survival, a guide for negotiating the job search wilderness. We have how to uh, work a room, uh, probably in the COVID uh, crisis by Kathleen Gallagher and Angela Smith. And then a recruiter uh, that I know, Tim Murphy, will be talking about preparing for the economic storm in the aftermath. So, uh, Megan, I will unmute you. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. And then uh, I can. you should be able to screen share. Okay. Um, and bring up your presentation. One second. What we're going to do is, uh, while she's bringing it up, one of the th I attended an HR seminar, two-day seminar, and there's a lot of restrictions on private employers. And one of the comments that stuck with me is, whatever the government imposes on private employers, they don't have to abide by. So, 
you know, this issue with salary as far as um, the employers, yes, Illinois ha has put that out. But if you look at an Illinois application or a federal application, uh, you do put salary down. Uh, federal applications, if you look at hierarchy, the state is below the federal. So the federal uh, would be pref whatever they say is going to outrank what the uh, individual state says. Uh, Sorry, I just need one second. I apologize. It's okay. Little, little... Uh, 20 second first applications. The close. You know, if you owned a business, it's still a company. You would put that down. Uh, okay, IRS, congratulations. Okay, so uh, I hope that's taken care of everything. And looks like Megan, you're ready to start. Just about. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Thanks for your patience, guys. You'll probably have to talk a little bit louder with your speaker okay. and I am going to uh, okay are we, video. can you hear me okay is that all right that's yeah, better now perfect um, thanks for your patience guys sorry about that um, <laughs> unfortunately those uh, updates to the computer come and it's kind of do it now or <clears throat> it kind of gives me no choice to postpone it um, so anyways um, so Performance-based interviewing is kind of the interview style that the federal government does. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit just about what that means. Um, let me just move this over. Um, so it focuses on what you've done in the past as a way to predict what you're going to do in the future. So they're kind of more action-oriented questions. So a traditional question, for example, might be, how would you handle an upset customer? Whereas a PBI question might say, please tell me about a time when you had to deal with an upset customer. What was the problem? What did you do? And what was the outcome? So they kind of follow this format of problem, action, solution. So here's an example on the left-hand side here. Oops, sorry, this, there we go. Um, where, you know, the problem, um, this would be a response that would be an appropriate PBI response. So identifying the problem as a store manager at ABC Office Supplies, I was in charge of every employee's safety. One day an employee accidentally cut her hand with an X-Acto knife and began bleeding. The action step I took as the first person to reach her, I used a clean towel to stop the bleeding called 911, helped her remain calm until the paramedics arrived. The result was after seven stitches at the hospital, the employee was on her way to recovery. And because of my composure under pressure, the CEO of ABC Office Supplies wrote me a very positive note of recognition that went into my personal file. So that just kind of is, it's a very simplified example, but you get the idea. Um, a PBI interview is going to be a panel interview. So it's never going to be a one-on-one -on -one interview, usually not, I should say. Um, but, and these are kind of the different levels here. So level one PBI style interview will be like for a position you apply for that's for like frontline staff, you're not supervising anyone. The level two style PBI questions might be for more supervisors, team leaders, work unit leaders, Level three PBI questions are going to be more like your mid-level managers, um, generally those who supervise level two staff or divisions or departments or like a program director. And then level four type of uh, PBI questions are going to be executive leaders, um, people who are responsible for overall functioning or outcomes of the organization. And so here's just an example of like, what different level one, level two, three, and four positions might look like. So if we're talking about uh, questions related to creative thinking, these are the different types of questions you might get depending on the level of position you're applying for. There is no way of knowing what 
like that that information is not documented anywhere like in the job announcement or when you go in for the PBI interview they're not going to tell you this is a level 1 or a level 2 but just know that like if you're not supervising anyone you can probably anticipate that level one is probably where the complexity of the questions will be. If you're supervising or applying for a program director position, um, you might anticipate that your questions will be a little bit more complex. Um, as you can see from the example, they kind of get, they expand out to be a little bit more looking at the macro level of a program um, or an organization. So. Oh, and then these are my resources. And, uh, and my information is also listed at the bottom. And if anybody would like information more about the PBI interviewing, I can certainly send like some other sample questions. Um, it's always good when you're going into the PBI interview to have already thought about just what are some basic examples. So, you know, working well with teams of people is usually kind of one I see a lot. The creative thinking one is definitely uh, a question I see come up. Um, you know, having a difficult problem that you had to solve, or maybe where you had to come to your team with the new ideas about something, um, kind of how was it received? What was the outcome? Um, just starting to think about like, what are some concrete examples? One thing we hear from HR or from hiring managers in the interviews is that people give too general of an answer. So if I asked you, um, you know, or if you were asked, um, you know, how do you deal with a difficult person? If you were to give me a general answer such as, well, you know, when I met with difficult people, what I usually try to do is understand their perspective. I try to listen very carefully. I try to come up with solutions with them. That's not a bad answer, but it's pretty broad. And you can give that kind of broad context as long as you follow it up with some type of like, for example, when I was working at, you know, Joe Smith Hardware, I had this really difficult person I was working with. This is how I approached it. This is what happened. And this was the outcome, you know? And obviously you always wanna try to put a positive spin on things, but try to be as concrete and um, follow that like problem action solution format as much as you can. And that's it. That's actually all I have. <laughs> okay, Megan. Uh, you have, uh, everyone should have the contact information and for Megan. So if you have specific questions or need help or anything like that, uh, contact Megan. I do want to interject real quick, Jim. Someone had asked about that OPM GS scale. Um, in my resources here, I did list a link that is to the OPM GS pay scale. And then there are a couple of other links to like more specifics about the veterans preferences, um, that SF-15 form you need, um, and some of those hiring authorities. So just so folks know. Okay, great. Uh, again, <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can view my... Oh, do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, okay. I just wanna go over my stuff. Again, uh, those of you, the code to talk with your counselors is US Fed 302. Uh, the workshops, uh, the job clubs coming up, June 5th, survival guide for job search. Uh, wilderness, I'll be doing that. Kathleen Gallagher and Angela Smith will be talking about working a room during the COVID crisis. And Tim Murphy, he's a recruiter, talking about preparing for the economic storms aftermath. Uh, Megan, I really appreciate everything you've done here today. Thanks uh, for having me. Yes. And Can we have a couple people with their hands raised that have been waiting that have questions. 
Okay. Uh, why don't you talk about those? Because I don't. I'm just in the question and answer. I don't sure. have. Sure. Um, Teresa, you want to go ahead and ask Megan your question? Oops. Is she in chat? Yes. Um, I know she's on the participant list. I just I'm having trouble unmuting her. Okay. Let me look in participants. I guess I have to do it, huh? Yeah, you have to do it, Jim. Okay, Teresa. I'm back. Hello, I'm back. The question is: is was the a, um, a a a format or a worksheet that was sent out to the participants with her information and with this program on it? Um, yes, it was, and we'll also be emailing everyone um, probably about an hour after this with the recording once it's processed. And that'll include all the presentation slides, the brochure, as well as a sample resume. Thank you very much. No problem. And Glenn? Glenn, are you still there? I, I'm that's having it. problems. You have to unmute Glenn. Yeah, I'm trying to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> he might have walked away. Oh, I don't know why it won't let me. Yeah, he might have walked away. He, he has to accept it as well. Okay. All right, I think that's all the questions with the hand raise raising. Okay. Please feel free to, um, you know, my contact information's on that last slide and uh, Jim, you've got my info. So please feel free to disseminate and I'll try to get back with folks as soon as I can. Um, if you want to put up your email again, uh, I just stopped my share. So if you want to put up your email slide again, sure. contact info. Yeah. Um, one second. Um, okay. There we go. Oh, whoops. Hey, sorry. All these things that popped up. No, I don't know how to make the chats go right now. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So down at the bottom is uh, Megan's contact info. Oh, whoops. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's most important right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if anybody wants me to review resumes, just to kind of take a look at it. Um, the federal resumes, they'd be happy to do that. Um, you know, or if you have more specific questions, just reach out. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and let's switch scenes again. Uh, they want my contact info as well. Okay. Uh, um, so, okay. Well, I tell you what. Here's uh, my info. Uh, well, that's not what I wanted. Sorry. Uh, so my info is uh, jfergal at worknetdupage.org. Um, and I encourage you, if you're new, to go to worknetdupage.org. Uh, sign up for the uh, layoff to launch workshop if you're new for Tuesday 930 uh, and see what other programs we have available okay uh, I don't think there's anything else so at this time uh, I'm going to end this uh, Megan thank you very much a lot of info fantastic presentation oh, Appreciate thank it. Yeah, thanks Megan Thank okay. You. All right, everyone. Thank you for attending. See you next week. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.